You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Just a heads up, this conversation touches briefly on themes of suicide. If you need help, call Lifeline on 13 11 14. This is an episode about pronouns, but not really. It's actually about love and shame and freedom and acceptance and painful struggles and life-changing revelations. My name is Mia Friedman, my pronouns are she, her, and you're listening to No Filter, a podcast from Mamma Mia, where people from all walks of life tell their stories very candidly and aren't afraid to be vulnerable. And this is officially the first time I've started a No Filter episode by talking about grammar or pronouns, but it's actually a lot more riveting than I've just made it sound. You might have noticed that some people are starting to state their pronouns in places like their email signatures and their social media bios. They might be saying they, them, or he, him, or she, her, they, them. This episode is about so much more than words though. Today, we are gonna talk about what it means to be non-binary and why pronouns actually matter. Now, I have two requests before we go any further. The first is that no matter what you think you think about this topic, I want you to open your mind and your heart and be open to new ideas. I want you to come with curiosity. And my second request is that you pause this podcast, open your Instagram or even just Google and type in style by Denny, D-E-N-I. Type it into your search and I want you to take a look at my guest. Now, this is something that we've never done before, but rather than me describing Denny to Dorovich, I want you to have a mental picture of them in your head as we talk because I just couldn't possibly do them justice. I'm wearing rainbows and glitter today because I know you have a penchant for those things. So fucking glad. Look, I've got (laughs) rainbow necklaces on. Love that for us. I'm all about the rainbow. Should we get stuck in? Let's do it. Denny Todorovic grew up in regional Victoria. And from a young age, Denny knew they were gay. But coming out to their Jehovah's Witness parents in the family home, well, that wasn't easy. I remember my mum just having like bloodshot, teary eyes. And she stared me straight dead in the eyes. And she said, that's okay. This is a problem and we can fix it. Fast forward to 2020, and during lockdown, Denny was back to the living room. They had more news. They were non-binary. I said to them, this is how I've always felt. I've just never had the language to articulate it. I always knew that I wasn't a boy. At some point, as a little kid, I thought, maybe, are you a girl? Maybe do you want to be a girl? But the older I became, I knew that that was not the case either. This is who I am. I finally have the language to articulate it, but nothing else has to change. So what does it actually mean to be non-binary and why are pronouns so important? I've admired Denny for a long time. We both worked at Cosmo magazine actually, but at very different times and I was long gone by the time they were a fashion editor. And I'm so sad about that because I think we would have hit it off. We might've even been work wives or work spouses. We share a very similar fashion style that could probably best be described as unicorn rainbow glitter. Denny and I recorded this conversation during the Sydney lockdown and I'll be honest with you, I was struggling a little bit that day, but our conversation opened and lifted my heart in a way that I hope it will for you too. Here is the magnificent, glorious Denny. I want to start off with a dumb question because there are going to be quite a few in this episode, (laughs) but it's asked with love and good intention. So I know that you always say... No question's a dumb question. As long as it's asked with empathy and respect, we're all good. So much empathy and respect. Are there days when you feel more male and days when you feel more female or times in the day? Yeah, so it's really interesting. I think for me... It's not so much feeling more male or female, it's more like leaning into my masculine or feminine energy. So sometimes that manifests through what I'm wearing. Other times it might manifest in the environments that I'm in. Like it was really funny, the other night I was at a pub 
And I normally go to the men's restroom because it's just easier. And I walked into the pub not realizing I was wearing a skirt and I just went straight to the urinal because I prefer to pee standing up. And the guy next to me was like, oh, good day, mate. How are you? And I was like, yeah, really good. And in that moment, I almost forgot that I wasn't a bloke. Do you know what I mean? So like in those moments, sometimes I really lean into a mask energy and then, you know, to flip the coin, I'll go into the girls' toilets and not even realize that I'm not supposed to be there and just have a chin wag with the ladies at the basin. So it's kind of more of an energetic thing for me. But who you're attracted to sexually doesn't fluctuate and doesn't change. Not really. So I like the dick. What can I tell you, Mia? Mm, so um, same. Yeah, we love it. We love to see it. So I did have my first experience with a vagina owner last year. They were also non binary. And it was amazing. And I'm 33 and that was the first time I've ever gone down on a vagina. And I think in retrospect now, the reason why I felt so comfortable doing that was because they were also non-binary and it felt like a really safe space. But I called my dad the next day and I was like, dad, you'll never guess what I did. And he was so proud. He cried. (laughs) 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 Yeah. It's every dad's dream. It is. But for the most part, I still say, you know, I sexually am gay or we could say queer. As long as the other person has a penis, whether they're a cis man or a non-binary penis owner, I'm good. What's the difference between queer and gay? Queer to me is a feeling. You know, you could feel queer. I have friends who are cis women with boyfriends, but they have such a queer spirit allies are part of the queer community and by default are queer. Whereas I think gay is definitely something that we've used for a long time as a sexual orientation. So to me, to be gay is to be, you know, either a, let's say, man or female, just to make it simple, who is attracted to the same gender. So, you know, lesbians can be gay, gay blokes are gay, non-binary people can be gay, but I think anyone can be queer. You could be queer. And what's the difference between non-binary and trans? Sure. So this is something I learned recently. So trans is an umbrella term, which by definition, if you Google it, to be transgender just means that you don't identify with the sex that was assigned to you at birth. So by default, I am trans non-binary. Non-binary is someone who doesn't identify on the binary spectrum of gender. Now, when you come out as non-binary, for me anyway, I really did not feel like I had the right to use the term trans because trans people and especially trans women have been at the forefront of the plight that has been thrown towards the queer community. So I felt like I couldn't really own that. But I think the reason why that is, is because over time, media has painted the trans narrative to be a very binary one. You know, we went from Bruce Jenner to Caitlyn Jenner. And in my mind, that's what transgender meant. But now that I know what I know, I know that I also exist as a trans person. Right. Is that because you were assigned male at birth? Yeah. Yeah. But you don't identify as male, you identify as non-binary, which means... Neither one or the other. So, I mean, it's interesting. So even non-binary is an umbrella term. So within non-binary, you have gender fluid. So Sam Smith and Courtney Act, for example, they both identify as gender fluid. Gender non-conforming is the one that I most identify with. So that to me is just, you know, I refuse to conform to these like stereotypes of male, female gender. I think sometimes people think non-binary means that you identify as both, but for me, it more means that I'm neither. I'm a combination of all of those things, but I'm neither one of those things. And I know that might be a bit weird to understand, but that's kind of my everyday feeling. So for some people, non-binary might mean they identify as both at the same time. Others might be fluid, which means they fluctuate. Yeah. And some non-binary people like you identify as neither. Correct. Yeah. So what about the people who might say, well, why do you have to call that something? Can't Mm. you just be a bloke with a beard who sometimes wears a skirt? Yeah, I get that question a lot. And to that question, I wish it were that simple because I think gender identity is such a personal thing and 
you know, I feel the way I feel now that when I hear people say he or him or you're a man, it really grates on me and it causes a great amount of discomfort. And the trans community often feels something called gender dysphoria. So, you know, the way that I generally explain this is if you were to walk in a room and if every day for a week, people looked at you and said, hey, Lee, hey, Lee, hey, Lee, hey, Lee. And you're like, no, my name is actually Mia. That would start to piss you off after a while because you feel mm. invalidated. You don't feel seen. Um, you don't feel like a valued member of your own community. So similarly, if someone calls me a man, a man, a man, a man, it's like, no, 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 no. That's not who I am. So that's kind of generally the example I give. Can we go back to when you first started to realise that you might be gay? Do yeah. you remember the first guy that you had feelings for? Oh, do I ever. So I was four. I started school a year younger than I was supposed to. And so I had a crush on Brian Austin Green from 90210. He played a character called David and he was dating Donna. And in Victoria, when you start grade prep, you get assigned a buddy from grade six. And my buddy knew that I loved 90210 and she gave me a poster which had Tori Spelling on one side and Brian Austin Green on the other side. And I remember that in front of all my friends, I would kiss the picture of Tori Spelling. But when I was alone, I would kiss the picture of Brian Austin Green. So I knew I liked boys and I knew that that also wasn't the norm. The first time I had feelings, like actual romantic feelings, were probably like age eight or nine. We grew up with these two brothers who were just stunning. And I had like a huge crush on one of them. And I remember just like, you know, going to sleep and like dreaming about him at night as like a little eight-year-old kid. <laughs> so yeah. Did you have a word for it? No. I mean, I knew I knew of the word gay, obviously. You hear that word from quite a young age. What did it mean to you? It meant it was wrong and it was naughty and it was a sin. It was against God. You know, I come from a very religious, very big Serbian family and the word gay is wrong. And then also when you get to high school, the word gay becomes this like derogatory to, oh, that's so gay. It's like used in place of the word stupid. So you just constantly have like a negative connotation to this word. It's not nice. Were there any role models back then? When was this, the 80s, the 90s? I was born in 88. So the first gay kind of role model, I mean, I grew up with a mum who was obsessed with Boy George and George Michael and Freddie Mercury. So we listened to gay music all the time in the house, but I didn't necessarily put two and two together. Really the first gay person that I remember being even rumoured to be gay was Ricky Martin. But even that was so weird because it was like everyone around me would be like, oh yeah, he's gay, he's gay, he's gay. But he had not confirmed that at that point. So even then it was like, here's this man flamboyantly presenting on screen. I really resonated with him a lot, but yet he couldn't even own his truth. So even within that nature, I was like, oh no, being gay is a secret. You can't let people know that. How was gayness spoken about in your family? There was no gay people in my family as a kid. I remember hearing a story actually of an uncle that my mum had back in Serbia who killed himself. There was always whispers that he was our gay uncle. So no, in Geelong, there was absolutely no other gay relatives and gay was never necessarily spoken about. But what I do remember is that as a kid, my aunties would say to my mum, you know, he's going to be gay one day because I was just flamboyant from the get-go. And I remember my mum hearing, uh, saying rather, no, he's not. Like, just because he likes dresses doesn't mean he's gay. Little did she know. But that was my earliest memory of just hearing, like, that word be associated with real negative, like, spitefulness in their voice, you know? Who was the first person you told? Well, sort of by default, my parents. So my mum and dad read my diary when I was 13. I used to keep a diary, very babysitter's club. And... I was mortified. So I came home from, a, it was Anzac Day long weekend. I was sleeping over at a cousin's. I came home, mum sat me down and she said, your dad needs to have a chat to you. We were sitting in the living room and my dad goes, Denny, do you get picked on at school? And I was bullied incessantly every day of school, but I never told them. And I was like, yeah, I get picked on. And he was like, why? And I was like, oh, just the usual things. I get called a wog boy, like whatever, people are racist. And he's like, oh, do they call you gay ever? And I said, yeah. And he goes, but are you? And I said, no. And he goes, well, then why do you have a crush on your year nine science teacher? And I was like, you read my diary. <laughs> How Ooh, could wow. you 
Yeah. And he trapped you. Trapped me yeah. with good intentions, I guess. Mm. But I remember for the next three hours, me, my mum and my brother and my dad sitting in the living room and they were like, you're not gay. It's a phase. You just think you are because everyone's calling you gay. I remember my dad even saying something to the effect of, oh, I was in the army, honey. Like, I don't know what it's like. We all go through this phase. And I just believed them because I'm so close to my parents. And I was like, well, yeah, they're probably right. So that was really the first time it was brought up against my own will. The first time I actually told anyone of my own will was my best friend in high school. I told her via text message and then I took it back. (laughs) How did that happen? So we were talking about secrets and... She was like, oh, I've got a secret. And she was like hooking up with the most popular kid at school, but that was like a secret. And I was like, oh, I've got a secret too. And she was like, tell me, tell me, tell me. And I couldn't tell her. And then that night I sent her a text message and I was like, my secret is I'm gay. And then I came to school the next day and she was like, are we going to talk about this? And we sort of spoke about it for about a week. And then I said, no, 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 I take that back. (laughs) I'm not gay. False alarm. Why did you take it back? Because I was freaked the fuck Mm. out. I was so scared. I was like, no, 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 no. And I went to school before social media existed, but there was this thing called the Geelong Forum. It was like a blog, like very Gossip Girl-esque. And that night someone posted in the forum, oh, Denny's come out. Like Denny at Geelong High School has come out. So she had told someone. So then I came to school the next day and everyone was just staring at me and I was like, oh my gosh, this is my worst nightmare. What happened from there? So from there, we went back into the closet. We stayed there. Then it wasn't until my 19th birthday, I had this like existential crisis. I, at this point, had never kissed anyone, male, female, or otherwise. And I'm a hopeless romantic. And all I wanted to do was kiss someone. And I was going clubbing and all my mates were hooking up with people. And I was just like the loser in the corner dancing on the dance floor. Anyway, so... On my 19th birthday, my cousin set me up with a girl and I kissed a girl for the first time. And it was fun, but it was a kiss. Three weeks later, I kissed a boy for the first time at the same nightclub and everything changed. And I was like, shit, you're gay. And that was that. Was that a relief to sort of have that proof or was it scary or both? All of the above and so much more. It was terrifying. So if you can imagine, we're like in this like really dark nightclub. It's like the club in Geelong that everyone goes to completely straight, very masculine. And as we're making out, I'm having this like amazing moment. And then in the corner of my eye, I see security guards charge towards us, bouncers rather. And they were like, oi, none of that in this nightclub, get out. Oh my God. So it's like my first kiss is instantly met with homophobia and it was like so thrilling and I had a boner, but then I couldn't do anything about it and we had to leave and it was just like this whole thing and it was just like all the feelings at once, you know? And shame and humiliation. Yeah. Wow. How religious was your family? Oh, Mia. So from the ages of 10 to 18, we were Jehovah's Witness. So I don't know if you've ever met or know much about the Jehovah's Witness faith, but it's a very, very extreme version of Christianity. They're the ones that come and knock on your door on a Saturday, or they used to, and say, let me save your life, and here's a pamphlet, and, you know. (laughs) We went to church three times a week, every week, for 10 years. Being a witness means that you don't have sex before you get married. Masturbation is considered to be sinful. So you have all this shame around sex and then homosexuality is like, forget about it. So that was really, really quite hard and definitely not an environment that a queer person wants to grow up in, that's for sure. Is homosexuality discussed or did you ever hear it discussed in church or at home? Yeah, it was discussed in the sense of it's a sin, this is wrong. I remember just before my parents sort of stopped going to church, they stopped going to church for reasons other than me. I had enrolled into fashion school and the elder of the church came up to my dad and said, are you sure that's a good idea that Denny goes to fashion school? Because the fashion industry is inundated with gay people and I would hate for Denny to fall victim to homosexuality. What did your dad say? My dad said Denny's going to that school. Like that's the end of it. That's what Denny wants to do. And so when did you come out to your parents? So when I had that first kiss moment, things escalated really quickly. So I had the first kiss. 
two nights later, me and this person had given each other blowjobs in the back of my car. A week later, we'd had sex for the first time in the back of his car. And then when that happened, I was like, I have to tell mum and dad because we've always had such an open, honest relationship and lying to them to me felt even more sinful than what I was. So I came out to them like four weeks after my 19th birthday. I thought you were going to say that's when I knew I had to move out of home because I couldn't keep having sex in cars. (laughs) That too. Having sex in cars is not ideal, let me tell you. Tell me how it went down telling your parents. Were you shit scared? I was fucking petrified. So I came out to my mum and my brother. Dad was upstairs sleeping because he's a shift worker. He was a shift worker at the time. And I remember my mum just having like, bloodshot, teary eyes. And she stared me straight dead in the eyes. And she said, that's okay. This is a problem and we can fix it. And my brother just wrapped his arms around me and said, Denny, I love you. I've always known it's okay. And then we sat around and I said, mama, I can't, we can't fix this. Like this is beyond fixing. This is who I am. And she was like, how do you know? How do you know? And I said, because, mum, I've had sex with a boy. And she lost it. And then she was like, okay, we need to get your father. And she marched up the stairs, woke my dad up. Dad came down, sat down, and dad looked at me and said, darling, I've waited for you to tell me this since you were three years old. My dad was so beautiful in that he just said, like, please explain it to me. You know, how can you know if you've never had sex with a girl? And and I said, Dad, well, how do you know that you're not gay? You've never had sex with a man. And slowly he started to piece it together. So Dad was actually, like, my first ally. My mum, on the other hand, really, really struggled. It took her about three months, I reckon, to come to terms with it. But Dad was pretty good from the get-go. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it was so difficult for her? I think there's a really unique relationship that mothers and sons have My mum is my best friend and shortly after the like, we'll fix it comment, the first thing she really said to me was, okay, so you know you're going to get AIDS, you're going to die and you're not going to be able to get married or have children. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Because she grew up in the AIDS epidemic. That's all she knew, right? So I reconciled those comments by the fact that my mother was just scared. Mm. She was scared for what would the community say? What would your life look like? And then I also think that parents sort of premeditate what their kids' lives are going to be like. You have all these hopes and dreams, and they're often your dreams, not your children's dreams. And I think it was like suddenly all of that was just colliding and, and exploding in front of my mother's eyes. And she was like... Denny's not going to have the life that I imagined that they would have. Fuck. And I guess that she imagined she would have by extension. Correct. She's having a daughter-in-law and having Mm -hmm. in her mind the only way she thought she could only have grandchildren Mm -hmm. if that's the path that you took. So those three months, what did they look like between you and her? Because you're living in the same house. Mm. You're very, very close. She's basically said some really, really confronting things to you. Those three months were some of the hardest in my life. Those three months were the first time I had like genuinely suicidal thoughts and it was a really dark time. You know, watching your mother cry on a loop for two weeks is no easy thing to look at every day. In that space of the three months, the elders from our church came over and sort of looked at my dad and said, well you have to make a choice because my dad had responsibilities within our church and in order to support his gay son, he couldn't have those responsibilities. So my parents made a huge sacrifice in really letting go of that religion in order to support me, which was a huge amount of support. But then that was sort of juxtaposed with this everyday anger and everyday resistance. So my mum finally wrapped her head around it and she just said to me, okay, if this is the lifestyle that you're going to choose... We don't want to know about it. No boys allowed at home. If you have a boyfriend, I don't want to know about it. And sure enough, within three months, I had my first boyfriend and I didn't tell her about it. I told my brother and not her. And then one day my boyfriend called me and I was in the car with mum and she was like, is that your boyfriend? And I said, well, do you want to know about it? And she was like, well, just tell me. And it was like baby steps from there. So then they knew that I had a boyfriend. 
Then he wasn't allowed in the house. When he came to pick me up, he'd have to wait in the driveway. And then one night, dad opened the door and said, Ben, come inside. We want to meet you. And and they apologized to him and they said, you know, this is not because of you. This is a transition for us. And then a week later, they invited him over for dinner. So this was all about a six-month period. By that six-month period, I think they truly started to just accept it because they could see that I was happy Finally, I was in love for the first time and that was just something that they were going to have to support. Otherwise, I wasn't going to be in their life. So those were the hardest probably six months of that whole journey. It was just like lots of light and shade. A lot is often written about people coming out. But what about your parents? Did they have to come out to their community and their friends and their family? Yeah. So I wish now in retrospect that I would have known about things like PFLAG and communities where parents can go and seek support, but that was not an option. So the hardest thing was coming out to my grandparents. We didn't tell my mum's mum for about six months and we went over there and we told her and my grandmother freaked out. And I remember my mum saying, we didn't ask you for your approval. We're just letting you know. Wow. Yeah. And I think over that period, mum really started to almost just by default go into protective mode and be my ally. But for sure, like, especially with the church, being a Jehovah's Witness is a lifestyle. It's not a religion. So suddenly people don't see you at church anymore. People are asking questions. And it was this constant having to, like, come out to people, to their friends and their, you know, community. The one thing I remember was that no one from our church called my mum to say, how are you? And that really disappointed me because I thought this is not just a me thing. It's also a mum and dad thing. And how awful that not a single person would call just to check up on mum. You know, it was a really hard time for her. So she did go through a lot of that alone. Well, I was going to ask you if they lost friends, but it sounds like they definitely did. They lost a whole community of people, you know. I remember so clearly this woman, this awful woman, who her kids would hang out with my brother And they would still come over occasionally. And I remember her saying to her kids, don't use the toilet at Denny's house because you might catch AIDS if you sit on the toilet seat. Oh, God. You know, suffice to say, we don't speak to her anymore. So it was a whole thing. You you lose so much more than you expect Mm. at the start, for sure. I'm Mia Friedman, and you're listening to No Filter with Denny Todorovic. Denny, how do you untangle sex and identity and pride from shame if all of your formative experiences of being a gay person are around getting kicked out of a nightclub, being sort of gossiped about and taunted and being betrayed, having people say the most awful things, having people cry, having people end friendships because of you? a lot of therapy, a lot of therapy and a lot of self-discovery. I didn't really realize the hangover that shame would have until maybe like a good four or five years later. You know, at first when you come out, well, for me anyway, I was just so proud. I had this gorgeous boyfriend. I moved to London for him. I was living my true life. I actually didn't have a lot of shame to start off with. It wasn't until I started to meet more queer people and specifically gay men. And I started to see the way that shame affected their lives and the way that it affected my relationships with them, the way that with shame comes depression, anxiety, substance abuse, abuse in general. You know, queer people are abused so much as children that they often become abusers. So every relationship I've ever had has been abusive. So that shame sort of begins to like rear its ugly head. At first, you just want to like throw on a rainbow (laughs) and get to the nearest gay bar. You know, you're just excited. But then it's not until you're really in that, that you start to feel ashamed. So I started therapy when I was 22 and I'm 33 now and I've been in therapy on and off for that time. That helped a lot in having conversations with other queer people, reading books, you know, like just self-informing has helped a lot. But it's something that I think never really escapes you, ever. Let's just go back to things are settling down with you coming out as gay. You're exploring mm-hmm. yourself. Your parents are back on track. Yeah. 
Your dad always has been, but mum's come online. Things are okay. Yeah. When does the non-binary issue raise its head? So when I was living in Sydney, I lived in Sydney for six years, and when I worked at Cosmo, our old friend, we did this amazing pride campaign and I was in charge of it. And I got an email from someone and their um, their pronouns were in the signature of their email. It said they, them. And I was like, oh, what's that? I've never heard of that before. And I was super confused. And I actually remember showing it to Bronwyn. I was like, Bron, look at this. This is weird. Bronwyn, the editor. Yeah. Yeah. The editor um, of Cosmo at the time. And neither one of us actually really kind of understood it. And I just ignored it. How many years ago was this? So this was like a good five years ago. Mm. Yeah. Then about three months later, the show Younger on Stan debuted and Nico Tortorella is non-binary. And I that shocked me so much because they present so masculine on that show. And I was like, oh, he's such a hot boy. And then someone said, oh, no, 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 they're a hot person. And I was like, oh, what's that? So that was like the second moment. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. Simultaneously to this, I started to really hang out with a lot more queer people in Sydney. I started to, you know, party in like Erskineville instead of Oxford Street. And when you party at like the Imperial, you see boys in skirts and androgynous women. And you see people that just look very different to what you thought queer looks like. And suddenly I was like, wow, this is so cool. These people are so liberated. Like maybe I can dress like this. So actually the team at Cosmo will could easily pinpoint the moment when I started to wear heels, wear skirts, um, you know, double with makeup. It was a real, like, physical moment of change. And my friends and family back home would say things like, oh, are you a drag queen now? What's with all this jazz? And I was like, nah, I'm still a bloke. I'm just wearing a skirt because of my own internalised transphobia. Anyway. Did you think maybe I want to be a drag queen? I like dresses and I like nails and... No, I mean, (laughs) I wish I could be a drag queen. I wish I was that talented. No, it was more like maybe I can finally start to express the way I've wanted to since I was little. Mm. Um, But in that moment, those moments of self-expression were generally reserved for Mardi Gras, uh, music festivals. It was very performative, nightclubs, stuff like that. I couldn't really walk into the office in a pair of heels. It, It took me a while to get to wearing heels like by day. How did that go down in an office? I mean, you were the fashion editor of Cosmo, so you had some latitude, but, you know, it's still a pretty conservative building. Yeah, you know, I am forever grateful to those women and the one man that worked at Cosmo for just embracing it. I remember, like, walking out of the fashion cupboard and showing all the beauty girls these heels and they were just like, oh, my gosh, amazing. Never once did they say, why are you doing this all of a sudden? Like, never once. It was just embraced. It was beautiful. I actually remember walking out of Park Street in, like, this big gown onto Castle Ray Street to take a photo. And the security man, you know, the coffee man, they all just laughed and they thought it was brilliant. It was really, really embraced. But still, at that point, it was just self-expression. It wasn't until Sam Smith came out as non-binary and I read an article that they wrote that I really, like, got a lump in my throat because I was like, oh, fuck, I feel exactly the same way as as they do. What was it that they said that resonated with you? They spoke about ever since they were little, they knew that they weren't a boy. They had a little bit of confusion in thinking that maybe they wanted to be a girl But then the older they got, they realised that they just possessed this sort of magic about them, that they could lean into both. They spoke in quite detail about the way that they have sex and the way that their body moves so femininely when they're bottoming or the way that it might move super masculinely when they're topping and all of these things. And I was reading all of this and I was like, whoa, this is this is really resonating with me. And that was the first time I thought, maybe I need to look this in the eye. How do you look something like that in the eye? Well, you don't until it's standing right in front of you. So maybe three months after Sam Smith and all of that happened, Levi's hosted this event for Mardi Gras. And I met two non-binary people, actually, for the first time at this event. It was a really beautiful event. And I was sitting next to both of them. 
and they were talking to each other and they were talking about their gender identity and one of them turned to me and started talking and said, oh, you know, how do you identify? Like, what are your pronouns? And I was like, he, him. And it's like they knew before I knew. And they just started talking really honestly and openly about their own gender identity. And when we left the event, I said, would you mind if we exchange phone numbers? I'd really like to call you tomorrow or later this week. So I called them later that week and I was just a mess on the phone crying. And I said, oh my God, I think... I am what you are too. And they really, they were my like coach almost through that whole moment. But it literally wasn't until those two humans were standing in front of me that I couldn't ignore it anymore. How did they coach you through it? They just created the safest of spaces for me to talk, to to tell them how I felt. They sent me a bunch of non-binary people to look up and listen to and read they they talked a lot to me about the sort of the fact that there are no rules because I said to them, does this mean I can't call myself gay anymore? Like I've been gay for 12 years. I'm proud of that journey. I don't want to do another journey. And they were like, Denny, there are no rules. You can feel how you feel. You can be non-binary and be gay. And, you know, and then I said to them, do I have to change my pronouns? I don't want to change my pronouns. And they were like, you don't have to do that either if you don't want to. Like You can make this up as you go. This is your identity. And they just kept bouncing on and off. But then they would sort of really beautifully say to me, you know, the first time someone used they, them pronouns for me, for them, it was like a light bulb moment. So I'll check in with you in a few months and let's talk about pronouns. And and they were exactly right, you know. So I don't know what I would have done without them. They really held my hand through that whole process. It was beautiful. How did you know you were ready to change your pronouns? So that was actually a really like silly mundane moment. I was doing some crazy, like boring personality quiz on Buzzfeed or something during lockdown. And before I started the quiz, it asked me to choose my gender and it said male, female or other. And in that moment, without even thinking about it, I just ticked other because I was like, of course I'm other. And then I was like, wait a second. I need to change my pronouns. It makes no sense for me to have he, him pronouns. And that was the moment. And so that was probably like four weeks after I came out as non-binary. What was the first thing you did to change your pronouns? Did you change them in your own head in a way first? Yes, yes, absolutely. I changed them in my own head. I actually said to one of my best friends, um, Riley, he was the first person I came out to, I said, I'd like you to just use they, them pronouns for me just for a little while. Let's just try them on. We won't tell anyone else. So we did. Then I told, I've got like five, like ride or die pals. Then I told all five of them and I said, could you all please start using they, them pronouns for me? And they did. And I loved it. Then I told my mum and dad. They were not as responsive. Back to the lounge room with mum and dad. (laughs) Back to the lounge room with mum and dad. Mum, you've come so far. We've got further to go. <laughs> All of our moments are in the lounge room. Like coming out as non-binary to them happened in the lounge room and there's lots of PTSD. But yeah, it was like a slow and steady transition to the pronouns. And then I finally like came out with the pronouns on social media and that was kind of the official, here we are. How did you explain it to mum and dad? Oh, so coming out as non-binary to mum and dad was way harder than coming out as gay. I wrote them a letter because I'm a, I'm a writer, it's my favourite form of communication, and I cooked them dinner and I made dessert and mum was like, why are you cooking for us? And I was like, because it's lockdown, like, just take a seat. And we had dinner and then I said, can we, um, can we have a chat after dinner just before we watch Netflix? And I got the letter and I said, I'm going to read this to you and then you can react, but please just let me get through the letter before you react. And I read them the letter And I said to them, this is how I've always felt. I've just never had the language to articulate it. I always knew that I wasn't a boy. At some point as a little kid, I thought, maybe are you a girl? Maybe do you want to be a girl? But the older I became, I knew that that was not the case either. This is who I am. I finally have the language to articulate it, but nothing else has to change. I'm still your son. I'm still my brother's brother. My niece can call me her uncle. All of that stuff doesn't have to change. 
but I'm giving myself the freedom to be who I am. So when I come out of my room in a pair of heels to go to brunch, I expect you to respect that and and understand that because I can't hide this anymore. This is not just a performative thing. This is not just something I want to do at Mardi Gras. This is who I am. And mum, dad straight away said, Denny, this is no surprise to me. This is who you've always been. Gave me a big hug. Mum did not. Mum was angry AF and was like, what's wrong with you? Why do you have to do this? Coming out as gay was enough. Are you going to change your name now? What am I supposed to call you? It was just so much resistance. So then that would go on to be the second time I had suicidal thoughts. and It was really hard. I'm so sorry. Thanks, honey. How did you get through that? Wow, it's going to sound so corny, but God and a higher power. That is not what I expected you to say. Yeah. So I don't believe in religion. I don't prescribe to religion. I hate it. The universe, God, the creator, whatever you want to call it, on the other hand, has always been there for me. I have a very strong relationship with them. I pray to God every day. And whenever I'm in moments of real darkness, I just look up to the heavens and I say like, mate, there's got to be more to life than this. I can't do this alone. I know that I'm of value. I know that I'm, I'm meant to be here. I deserve to be here, but I need your help right now. And so that's what I did. I I came out to them. It was like 9 p.m. We argued till about midnight and I went for a walk around the block and just sat in a car park and was like, I've got to end it. This is not, life's not worth it. And then it was like in that moment, I heard just like this whisper and I looked up and I was like, no, 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 we have to do this, but we're going to do it together. How do you argue with someone who tells you something about themselves? Like, how is there an argument? Like, no, you're not. (laughs) <laughs> Mia, <laughs> Mia, oh, is this like a white people thing? <laughs> Let me tell you, when you fight with an <laughs> ethnic mother, she will tell you how you're fucking feeling. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> um, oh, it was all the arguments and it was like, it was like, you know, what was the first thing that came out of mum's mouth was like, well, no one's going to want to marry you now. No one's going to love you now. This is too hard to love. Oh. Yeah, and it's funny now in retrospect, but, you know, in that moment, I think she was just so angry. She was angry. She would say stuff to me like, you know, why do you have to talk about this on Instagram? Why does everyone have to know? I've heard people say that before. It's really interesting that you that you say that when the subject of non-binary comes up and pronouns. I've heard mm. anger as an as an emotion that's expressed by people and not just people whose loved ones have have come out as non-binary but people who are just when the subject comes up in general uh, about pronouns mm. why does it make people angry i have multiple theories on this i think the reason why it makes people angry and specifically my mum's age my mum and dad are 54 right so that group of people are very stuck in their ways They grew up also in a time of rigidness and rules and categories and you can do this and you can't do that. If we look at feminism, it's the same thing. I often find that the most anti-feminist women are people of that generation because they're like, well, you can't have all these rules because I didn't get them. So I think it's kind of the same thing. It's like all these, you know, older people are kind of like, well, what's, what's up with this generation? Why do they feel like they can choose their gender? That's not true. But actually, if you look at the facts, non-binary people have existed since Indigenous people. There are many Indigenous cultures that, you know, have history of, of non-binary identity. So I think the resistance comes from privilege, to be honest. It's like heterosexual, sorry, it's cisgendered privilege. Because like you've lived in this world, it's favoured you. And now suddenly this group of people are going to push your buttons and tell you that actually... That's not the way it works. Your binary system doesn't actually allow for everyone to live an equal, safe life. So we need to change that. Anger often comes from fear. Do you think that there's a fear that some people have of getting it wrong? Like, oh, now you want me to use these pronouns and I don't know how and why can't we just have boys and girls? 
Yeah, it's absolutely fear. And you know what's really sad is that what I'm starting to notice is so many people are too scared to stuff up that they just choose silence. And by default, the trans experience is then a really lonely one because people are now too scared to speak to you. They used to be too scared of you because you're like this, you know, freaky kind of person. Now it's like, well, no, I don't want to talk to that person because I might stuff up. But what I always say is we're all human. I fuck up my pronouns all the time. I stuff up other people's all the time. If we don't try, and if we come with good intention, as you said at the start of this conversation, I don't care what you call me. If you come with good intention and you're open for growth and evolution, that's all this is, then it's all good. And don't, why let fear hold you back from the beauty of new connections and, and kind of opening your mind? It just That's just not how I operate. So I often really struggle with that fear, but it is absolutely fear. I was listening to an interview that you were doing with Sean Zepps about your coming out story, which was beautiful mm, on his you. podcast, Come Come Out Wherever You Are. And there were a couple of times that you used the wrong pronouns for people and yeah. you just quickly corrected yourself. Yeah. Is that the best way to do it if you stuff up, to not make a big deal, just correct yourself and move on? Absolutely. My pronoun guide 101 is if you stuff it up, quick correction, let's move on. You don't even need to necessarily apologize to me. Literally just correct yourself as you're chatting and we move straight along. The second you go, I'm so sorry, this is really hard. I'm still wrapping my head around it. It just makes it all about you. It makes the trans person really uncomfortable and it's it's just not necessary. So yeah, it's fine. I do it all the time. And I literally correct myself as I go. Were there people in your family or your friends who thought that maybe coming out as non-binary was a step towards another chat in the lounge room when you say you're trans and that you want to be Mm -hmm. a woman? Yeah, I actually got asked that question on the weekend by my cousin. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I think, and I've said this before, you know, spoiler alert, my parents are super supportive now because they're amazing. However, (laughs) at the beginning, if I came out to them and said, mum, I want to be a girl, they would have actually preferred that because that would have made more sense to them because that would have been more, more binary, more linear. This is confusing to them and they just assume this will lead. And when I say they, not mum and dad, but most people often assume that this is like a one-way step to to transitioning. Much like people say bisexuality is a one-way street to being gay. Well, sexuality and gender identity are two very different things. You know, I have extreme comfort and love and confidence in my body. I love my penis. It's wonderful. I don't want to change it. I have no desire to. So that's not going to happen. Um, will I wear a frock to my wedding? Maybe. Will I wear a suit? Who knows? Maybe I'll do both. But all the body stuff, that's not going to change. Can you explain passing and how being non-binary, I mean, you have a beard. So it's not like you're trying to make people think you're a girl sometimes. Yes. So passing is basically a term that we use in the queer community when, or in the trans community when someone passes for the gender that they appear to be. So I'm male passing, which is why, you know, I use a men's restroom because sometimes it's my only option. There's no like gender neutral toilet. And I walk in with my facial hair and, you know, and then the leg hair, but then also the acrylics and people get really confused. So that whole thing is actually really interesting because even with that, when I came out, my mum said to me, well, I wish you would just shave that beard, shave your legs, I'll help you. You'd look so much more feminine. You'd look so much more like a woman. And I'm like, but that's not the point here. I'm not trying to be female passing. I know that I'm male passing, but I'm not a man. And that's kind of what that is. But yeah, um, I think it doesn't maybe help (laughs) in a way, but it's who I am. And I love those parts of me and I love my masculine energy. And I'm really proud of that. So it's not something I you know, feel the need to wipe away with. But then maybe that's also looped up in my own internal things. You know, like I still don't wear lipstick because lipstick to me feels very girly and I'm too scared to wear lipstick, even though I'm dying to. 
So, yeah, it's weird. There are a few things that still feel very, like, cross-dressy to me sometimes. And what is the difference between being non-binary and cross-dressing? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, cross-dressing is a term that we've had since the 80s. It's often what people, you know, would call non-binary people, even long before that, actually. You know, there are people who have kinks and fetishes and just, likes, right? They like to dress in a way that is feminine, just say men in this example. It might turn them on. It might make them feel really good. It might turn their partner on. Like, you know, there are many options here. That to me is probably more aligned to that sort of expression. Whereas for me, I just wear whatever I feel like on the day. But I also think it's really important to to acknowledge that like I'm one non-binary person And this is how I present. I do not represent the whole community, right? There are people in the non-binary community who sort of quote unquote dress normally. And it's just the way that they feel. I am a sucker for fashion and I just love it. And it's, it's part of who I am. So I'm just like so thrilled now that I have triple the option. But I don't ever see that as cross-dressing. And I talk about de-gendering fashion a lot on my socials because clothing is clothing. (laughs) You know, since you started dressing the way you dress now and you've come out as non-binary, have you noticed a difference in the people who hit on you? Yeah, actually. I mean, it's interesting that has only started to happen of late because of COVID and we can actually go to nightclubs and things now. When I was like a gay bloke, let's say in Sydney and I was wearing a kilt to arc, I would always get hit on 10 times more if I was in a kilt or a pair of heels than I would in a pair of sneakers and jeans. Because boys would always say to me, your confidence is so attractive. I love that you can just own that. What I'm noticing now is that, you know, I have a hinge profile, for example. The people that swipe on me generally are people who are more queer than they are gay. You know, they're kind of probably like leaning towards the Gen Z age bracket or the sort of early millennial age bracket. I'm getting hit on by younger people a lot more than I ever used to be because I think Gen Z don't care about gender. So yeah, it's definitely making a bit of a difference, which is kind of interesting. And just finally, if someone does come out to you as non-binary or as queer or as gay, what's the best response? Mm, Good question. The best response is to simply say, you know, darling, I hear you. I love you. This is a safe space. I'm here to hold space for you. I think often when when queer people come out, the person on the other end tends to make it a little bit about themselves, in especially in family dynamics. So if you can, in that moment, do them the grace of just focusing on making them feel really safe and validated. And by all means, afterwards, go and scream into your pillow and have your little freak out. But please don't do that in front of them. Because, you know, I so appreciate you holding space for this conversation on your podcast and with your audience, because trans youth in Australia are 11 times more likely to attempt suicide than cis youth. And gay youth are five times more likely to attempt suicide than straight youth. So, If we are creating safe spaces, which starts with parents, it starts with mums, right? Mums are the best. Like, sorry, dads, but they are. And if if mums can just create safe, wonderful spaces for their kids to be who they are, no matter what they are, then they will just be and those rates won't exist anymore, you know? That's the end goal, really. Should you say congratulations? Congratulations? Oh, my gosh, please. I would love that. Okay. That would be beautiful. That would be so beautiful. It is so celebratory. Oh, my gosh, Mia, I love that. Congratulations. Thank you. Not enough people have said that to me ever. Congratulations. And thank God we have you in the world. Oh, That's all I can say. Right back at you, darling. Oh, I hope you loved that. I loved that so much. I think having thought about it more since we recorded our interview and before when I was researching what it means to be non-binary and Denny's story, 
There's often resistance when things evolve. Not everyone is on board. And I know that some people find change really confronting. I get that. I've learned so much about this issue, actually, just by talking to younger people who don't even question it, let alone find it difficult to understand. And here's where I've landed. No matter what you think about someone else's choices around their pronouns or their gender identity, if tweaking the way you speak about them just a tiny bit and using the pronouns that they prefer, if that can make them feel more comfortable, more seen and more understood, why wouldn't you? It doesn't cost you anything. And it adds enormous value to someone who has already had to show a huge amount of courage in coming out. And if you want to learn more about the LGBTQIA plus community, there is a great episode of our daily news show, The Quickie, that explains what each of those letters stand for, and we will link it in the show notes. The assistant producer of No Filter is Lucy Neville. The executive producer is Eliza Ratliff. Make sure you're following Denny on at Style by Denny. I'm Mia Friedman, and I'll see you on the Mamma Mia app. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures.